Good morning. Uh, my name is Douglas Griffin. This is my Sunday school class where we're in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 17. We've been going through the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, um, because it, it's easier to get the full story if you just go verse by verse through the Bible. There's an understanding that you can get of certain things that you may not have seen before if you're looking at everything that's leading up to a particular action that God is doing or a law that he's giving out, or you can say, oh, I can see why God did that or why he said that because I can see everything that led up to it. When we take things out of context, and we're not, no one would do that on purpose. I think I'll just take a bunch of stuff out of context. But when we take things out of context, um, there we go. When we take things out of context, um, we can sometimes come up with the wrong interpretation of a verse. Uh, obviously not on purpose. Um, and so that's why I try to go through, straight through. Now, it, God has brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. He took them to the brink of the promised land, but they refused to go in. And so he realizes that this generation that was born in Egypt whose parents and grandparents and great-grandparents were born in Egypt, four generations that had studied Egyptian gods, Egyptian ways, Egyptian thinking, that they were going to have trouble learning to obey him uh, because they just had a whole different theology, a whole different philosophy about God and all the gods and how the universe works. And they just didn't understand that this God is in charge of everything, that the giants that were in front of them were nothing to this God. In Egypt, gods had their little assignments, little tiny serfdoms, little areas that they were in charge of, and and their gods could be flummoxed. Uh, but they didn't understand, no, this God that they're serving is the God of everything. So when they see giants, it's nothing to God. When they see if there's no food, that's nothing to God. If they, if they see the Red Sea, that's nothing. God's the one that created all of it. And they, they just couldn't, that just didn't sink in. They, so he says, okay, this generation will have to pass away. I'll take care of them. I'll clothe them in the wilderness for 40 years. But the next generation that didn't grow up in the wilderness, but rather grew up, I mean, didn't grow up in Egypt, but instead grew up in the wilderness, seeing my work, seeing my provision every day, seeing how I protect them and how I, I give them victories over their enemies. That generation, when I take them over into the promised land, they'll obey me when I say, walk around the walls of Jericho seven times. They'll think, well, I'm sure that God's got a plan and I'm sure this is going to work and, because they've seen him work. But the previous generation had no relationship with God. Um, they'd only had relationship with the Egyptian gods. So, so here we are in the book of Numbers. Um, and I just want to remind us what has happened. Let me... Korah... Well, so God chose Aaron to be his priest, to... Uh, be over the sacrifices when people came to repent of their sins and to celebrate God or however they, for whatever reason they came to the temple, the priests were going to facilitate that and God chose specifically Aaron and his line, his family to do that. Now he gave other priests work, he gave other, his, Aaron's cousins and uncles and he, uh, but they were jealous and they felt we should be we should be doing that. Uh, so just to remind us, in Numbers chapter 16, it says, They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much on yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, and every one of them, and the Lord is among them. And why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? This is kind of typical. Uh, who, who appointed you to be over everybody? We all know God, and we all know... we. Now, interesting, again, they had chosen not to. They said, Moses, you go talk to God. We don't want to. But now that they see things are happening, now that it's all exciting, and now, now they want to be a part of it. But God's already chosen a specific person to do those things. So 
Here was Aaron's solution in number 16. It says, do this, verse 6. Take censers, Korah, and all your company, and there's 250 of them. Put fire in them, put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You, you take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. And so what they had seen a few weeks earlier is once they built the temple and they put the sacrifice on the temple and they put the coals and all of that, that fire came down with the Lord and he accepted their sacrifice. Uh, uh, that sacrifice was for the sins of many. So he's saying, let's do the same thing. You're going to take censers. We're going to basically have a little mini altar that you're carrying around with you. And then we'll see whom the Lord comes down and consumes and who he doesn't. In Numbers chapter 16, verse 35, it says, And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy, and scatter the fire some distance away. So, yes, I consumed them, but I, I need my censers back. So, went and got his censers. Uh, and I just want to uh, just remind us in, in Numbers chapter 16, verse 5, it says, And he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is holy and and who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near him. That one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near him. So uh, this is what was supposed to be settled. Who is the person that God is choosing to be over all these things? Now, God was not done because the people say, well, yes, that all happened, but still, that doesn't mean that it's you're in charge. Yes, God was mad at those 250 people. That's why he consumed them. But who appointed you? God didn't specifically choose you. He simply got rid of them. So to, to them, there was a big distinction. Uh, I, we need something where God is saying specific in a positive manner that he's positively choosing you, not just that he got rid of those 250 people. That still doesn't mean that you're in charge. So, Numbers chapter 17, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the children of Israel, and get from them a rod from each father's house, all their leaders according to their father's houses. Twelve rods, and write each man's name on his rod. So, they would take these huge branches, I think from almond trees, these huge branches, and uh, remove all the leaves from them. And that was their rod that they would uh, walk with, like a scepter, like a king having a scepter. Um, and we, we've seen them in cartoons, and we said, you know, I, this is my, this is, this stick here shows that I'm the one in charge. So only one person got to have a rod from each tribe. Uh, in Numbers chapter 1, he'd already divided that up. Numbers chapter 1, verse 5, it says, These are the names of the men who shall stand with you, Moses. From Reuben, it'll be Eliezer. From Simeon, it'll be Shmuel. From Joshua, it'll be Nashon. And it just goes on down. Now, uh, when we remember back in Genesis, when uh, Abraham Isaac, when Jacob was prophesying to his 12 sons, he turns to Joshua and says, the scepter, the rod, the scepter, will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. So Judah specifically, your rod, your scepter, you're going to be a ruler until Shiloh comes, until the Messiah comes. Um, and so, so these rods represented authority uh, from Issachar. I'm just reading still from Numbers chapter 8. Nathaniel from Zebulon and from the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and, and Manasseh and from Benjamin and from Dan and from Asher and from Gad and from Naphtali. So all of these, these were chosen from the congregation, leaders of their father's house, tribes, heads of divisions in Israel. So 
each leader of each tribe, they had a rod. Because again, just because those 250 people were killed didn't mean to them that God was choosing uh, Aaron. He wasn't necessarily choosing Aaron. It was like, that doesn't mean any, that just means God didn't like those people. So God wanted to leave no doubt. And there are times in our lives, God doesn't want to leave any doubt. I think I call this lesson, God leaves no doubt. So that you'll know that you know that you know. Okay, so God will give a second sign, just in case you misinterpret the first sign. Uh, he'll, a second sign, like here's specifically what I'm doing and here's why. So, um, in, in Ezekiel chapter 37, Again, these, these rods that each man, each man from each, these branches, which is what they really were. Uh, Ezekiel 37, verse 16 says, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it. Because remember he said, take a, each, each of the leaders of the tribe, take your rod and write your name on it. For Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it. For Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and for all of his house of Israel, his companions. So I want you to take one of these branches that represents Judah and one of these branches that represents everybody else. And there was a big competition always between Joseph and Judah. Joseph and Judah. It started way back when, when the, uh, Joseph went down to Egypt and his brothers showed up and he made them leave Benjamin and Judah and Joseph were always vying for who is the real leader. So uh, during Ezekiel's time, 10 tribes were following Joseph incorrectly, and one tribe was following Judah, which was Benjamin. So he says, I want you to take us a, a rod from each of those tribes, uh, verse 17 of Ezekiel 37, and then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. <clears throat> so these two separate sticks, which are representing your tribe, I want you to join them together because, and they'll become one. So all throughout Israel's history, these, these, whoever had the rod, it was always, it was an important thing. It started here, okay, it represented more than just, here's my walking stick. So uh, Numbers chapter 17, verse three, and you shall write Aaron's name, on the rod of Levi. Now, Levi didn't have a rod. Uh, when I was reading all those names from Numbers chapter 1, there are 12 names mentioned, but Joseph has two because Joseph had two sons. He had Manasseh and Ephraim. Levi doesn't get its, didn't get its own rod because the, the priests, the Levites, were going to be spread out throughout all of Israel. Uh, when they came over into Israel, each of them were supposed to get, each family was supposed to get their own area. The Levites didn't get their own area. They were just going to be sprinkled around. So they didn't really have a, a rod. So they used Moses' rod. Uh, and remember Moses' rod in Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. It says, then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me. This is when the bush is caught on fire. Moses is out in the wilderness for 40 years. He's mad at the children of Israel. They won't listen to me. I'm through with them. This is before he comes back at the age of 80 and leads them out. So at the age of 79 and a half, this bush catches on fire. And, and God says, I want you to go back down there. And, and it's like, they're not going to listen to me. Uh, Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. You're crazy. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a rod. And this is his rod, his walking stick. And again, that's what they initially were. But God is using them differently to represent his power, right? So he says, it's a rod. It's, it's, I've been, this is my rod that I've been holding on to. So he said, well, cast it on the ground. Let go of it. Even though that's your rod that you've been walking with for 40 years in the wilderness, let it down. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. This is Exodus chapter 4. So what if they don't believe me? Well, then throw your rod on the ground and I'll turn into a serpent. And the serpent represents sin. God's not doing a magic trick. And that's how it's usually presented. That everybody goes, ooh, it turned into a snake. God's so powerful. 
no, he's showing them their sin. They know that the serpent represents sin. They know the serpent in the garden represents rebellion. That's when Adam and Eve listened to the serpent instead of God. So what if they won't listen to me? Then show them this serpent because that's what they're doing. You're, you're being Adam and Eve again. He could have turned the rod into an elephant. He could turn the rod into anything impressive, into a piano. Uh, so he, he wasn't trying to impress them with his magic. He was trying to show them this is what their rebellion is. So we know, so then it turned back into a rod and Moses went down and he used his rod. So Moses has a rod, but the tribe of Levi, they didn't have a rod. So Moses had to give up his rod to Aaron. So he says, take that rod, uh, cause that, so, so, cause Moses was the de facto leader of the tribe of Israel. I mean, of Levi, he was their leader, obviously. So, okay, I'll take that rod. Uh, then you shall place them in the tabernacle of meeting before the testimony. So put them in the tent and place them before. So the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark is there, which is that little mini coffin-like thing that God used for a seat. He sits on it. Inside the coffin was the tablets, the uh, Ten Commandments. That's what's in there. So take the rod and place it before the testimony. He calls it the testimony, the witness, which is the Ten Commandments, is my witness to them, where I will meet you. And it shall be that the rod of the man, so you're going to take all 12 and place them there. The rod of the man whom I choose will blossom. Now, once you take a branch off a tree and you walk with it for five months, five years, it's dead. It's petrified. At, you know, it's dead. So God's going to do a miracle. Uh, it's going to blossom. Flowers are going to come from it. Now, um, this is symbolic of God's life. He, uh, and again, I just want to say these rods, it, this is not a one-time thing. God kind of repeats himself on purpose so that we'll recognize what he's saying to us. In Isaiah chapter 11, it says, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. So the idea is God is the tree, and these branches are being pulled off of God, or these branches are being grafted onto God, you know, that, that I'm the life, I'm the tree, and you're a branch coming out from me. That's the image. Um, he says, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Let's say that Jesse, who's David's father, Jesse's David, King David's father. His branch, he says, there shall come a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So somewhere down on his line. Now, Jesse's grafted into God, but he said, you know, so a branch will have smaller branches, and they'll have smaller branches, right? So somewhere down in Jesse's line, he's going to have a descendant who will do what? The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. So he's talking about that branch that's alive and growing. Somewhere down the line comes Jesus. So I am going to take this rod and show that this person is still planted in me. Even though the rods have been broken off from the tree, I'm going to make it blossom to show you that my power and spirit is still flowing through that branch. This is the only branch that's connected to me. Those other branches are dead. This branch is alive. And can, so take 12 branches, bring them in, sit them down, and the one that blossoms, the one that blossoms is the one that's still grafted into me, still connected to me, that my power is flowing through. Numbers chapter 17, verse 5, second part. And thus I will rid myself of the complaints of the children of Israel which they make against you. So I'm doing this thing because I'm upset at the complaining. So even though I killed 250 people, judge them, the earth opened up and swallowed them, and again, warned them in advance, told them, Moses fell down in his face, please don't do this, please, it's terrible. No, we're doing it. We want God to show us, okay. So 250 people, they still weren't clear well, just because 250 people are gone, how do we know God is choosing you? So they're still complaining. So God's not loving complaints. God doesn't love complaints. And I'm, just, I'm saying this in advance for scripture I'm going to read later. I'm going to rid myself of the complaints of the children of Israel, which they make against you. 
So they won't have anything else to complain about because they'll know the only branch that's alive and write everybody's name on the branch. So I'm sure they carved it. I'm th in my mind, they had a Sharpie, but they didn't. So I'm sure they carved the name into the branch. Okay, verse six. So Moses spoke to the children of Israel. Each of the leaders gave him a rod apiece for each leader according to their father's houses, 12 rods. And the rod of Aaron was among their rods and Moses placed the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. They saw him take 12 branches in there, laid them all down. Again, these rods that people have been traveling with for 10 years, 20 years. Verse 8, now it came to pass on the next day that Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron of the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and had produced blossoms and yielded ripe almonds. Oh, yeah, that's why I thought it was an almond tree, because of the almond. I was thinking, I think it was an almond tree. Uh, and it yielded, so not only flowers, but ripe in one night. <laughs> flowers, blossoms, almonds, all this had come out because that's the only branch that was still connected to the original source. Uh, again, now, God uses this rod, this idea of this rod being connected to the source several times. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. On purpose. This is why Jeremiah sees the branch of an almond tree. Because God made Aaron's branch blossom with almonds, right? So, well, what do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree. And this is 500 years later. Uh, then the Lord said to me, well, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. This is what this means. When you see this, know that I am moving through that blossom. I am moving through that situation. I made that blossom, and I'm ready to perform my word. So that's how Jeremiah knew he was making the right decision. Now, unfortunately, he was judging. God was about to judge the tribes of Israel because they still weren't listening to him. 500 years later, they still weren't listening. So God had warned them. He says, well, now I'm watching over my word to perform it. I'm going to perform it, and I'm going to bring judgment. Um. So sometimes we gleefully say, God watches over his word to perform it. Well, yeah, to bring judgment in that case. Uh, but yes, but also for good things, right? In the case of Aaron, it was for good things. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 13. And the word, word of the Lord came to me to set the second time saying, what do you see? And he said, I see a boiling pot. So I see the positive. I see the branch and, and it's blossoming. What else do you see? Well, I see a boiling pot. And it's facing away from the north. So Israel's divided in half. All the northern tribes are following after Joseph, Ephraim, right? His son is Ephraim. Only two tribes are following after God in the south. Which, which one of them is correct? Which one of them is doing like, well, I see in the south this blossoming branch, but I see in the north boiling water. And it's facing away from the north. The Lord has said to me, out of the north, calamity shall break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. So that's why you see that boiling water pot, right? So God speaks in pictures to them all the time. He's a lamp. He's a door. When I teach on the book of Revelation, just know that God uses these pictures. God didn't really take a boiling pot and pour it out on all those people. They're symbolic. We take a lot of things in the book of Revelation, and think that God is suddenly specific, like being like this is the thing that uh, is a real thing. It's like, no, that's a metaphor. That's not really going to happen. People are not really going to have marks carved into their head. That's It's a metaphor for something. But uh, we'll get there when I teach the book of Revelation. You go, oh, I hope that you go, oh, this makes so much more sense. Thank you. Back to Numbers chapter 17, verse 9. Then Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord to all the children of Israel, and they looked, and each man took his rod. So mine didn't blossom. And the Lord said to Moses, bring Aaron's rod back before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels. So inside the ark is the Ten Commandments. He says, now I want you to bring the rod back before the testimony to be kept inside that ark, that little mini coffin, that God sit on, the, we called it the mercy seat, as a sign against the rebels, that you may put their complaints away from me lest they die. 
So I'm trying to get rid of their complaints. I don't like their complaints. Their complaining is bad. Now, there were three things that were kept in the ark. A pot of manna, jar of manna, this rod that blossomed, and the Ten Commandments. It was all bad. They were kept there for, quote, unquote, bad reasons, for disciplinary reasons, because people had done bad. We describe those things as wonderful and glorious. Ooh, the ark they had. And I, I read, and I'm surprised when I read, because I st study, right? I'm studying all these different commentaries, and all these things. say, well, what do you say this means? What do you say this means? But that's not what it says. This be kept as a sign against the rebels. Against the rebels. That's why I want to keep it. Because they did bad. It's like putting your tar parking ticket inside there. Because you got a ticket. Because you disobeyed the law. So I want you to keep that. So do you remember, I should not do that. Uh, not because it's glorious and wonderful. Okay. In, in, in Exodus chapter 25, verse 16. It says, and you should put into the Ark of the Testimony... You should put into the Ark of the Testament, which I give you. Uh, I'm sorry. You shall put into the Ark the testimony, which I give you. So the Ten Commandments were given as discipline. As discipline. The people were had rebelled. They had built a idol, a calf, a golden calf to go back to Egypt. He just brought them out, just part of the Red Sea. Finally got to the mountain, and they, could, they wanted to go back. So I'm, it, this is discipline for you. Thou shalt not kill. Don't steal. Don't have God before me. Don't make idols. Don't do, don't, these, I'm laying down this law because you're bad, and I want you to keep a copy of it to remind yourself of your rebellion and what you should not be doing. So I want you to put that in the ark. In Exodus chapter 16, when God gives manna, this is how it happens, right? Just reminding us. And the children of Israel said to Aaron and Levi, this is Exodus 16, 3, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when, you, when we sat by pots of meat and we ate bread to the full. We were so happy in Egypt, they're saying. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Okay, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Now, they're complaining. God wants to get rid of the complaint. I don't like the complaints. I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. This is discipline for them. This is a test for them. This is not some wonderful blessing. Just remind us that God's plan was each day to take them somewhere, and when they get there, they pray, Lord, how will you provide food today? And he'd show them some wonderful thing. But instead, when they'd get there and they saw there was no food, they didn't say, how will you provide food to us? They complained and said, you never feed us. You're trying to kill us. And like, I'm trying to get to teach you to obey me because I already have this provision for you. But if you do the right thing, if you do the right thing, you'll find it. You'll find the provision for me. All you have to do is ask and then obey what I tell you. Like cut down the tree and throw it into the water and it'll make the bitter water sweet. See, I had all this sweet water for you. You just had to obey me. But you're not doing that. You're complaining. Instead, you're assuming that I'm not feeding you, that I brought you out here to kill you. So you're complaining. Verse 8 of Exodus 16 says, And Moses said, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and in the morning, bread to the full. For the Lord hears your complaints which you make against them. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. So the complaining didn't make God go, oh my goodness, they're right. What was I thinking? I'm so stupid. Okay, you guys, here, let me just give you manna every day and then you don't have to worry about it. It was the opposite. The complaints were an insult to him as though God had not thought this out. Like God was making it up. Okay, wait, slow down, slow down. You're getting too fast now. Just let me think. No, God told them 200 years in advance what was going to happen. He's, he's got it all taken care of in our own lives. He's got it all taken care of. But we complain to God and we pray and we act like God, like this is new to God every day. That God's waiting up going, oh, what am I going to do today? I didn't know this was going to happen. So that's an insult to him. Like we don't understand his character and who he is. So he didn't like the complaints. The complaints didn't correct God. They frustrated him. 
So, so he's sending manna as discipline to them. Okay, I'm going to feed you this every single day. Where you could have had a wonderful treat each day, every day you're going to have manna. That's a punishment. For 40 days, you're going to eat the same meal every single day because that's what you want. You don't want to trust me. You don't want to wait to see what I provided. You want to already know in advance that everything's already taken care of. And that's not faith. So that's like uh, a little kid the night before uh, breakfast is due. Say, Mom, I need you to submit to me what breakfast is going to be tomorrow I, and what lunch and dinner I need to written down, and you know, and you let me know tonight. I don't have to wake up and wonder what I'm eating in the morning. I need to know now. And so God's like, okay, you don't have to ever wonder what you're eating in the morning. You're going to have manna every morning, period. And there's all sorts of wonderful things in this wilderness I could have provided for you. But you didn't want to wonder. So, okay. And that's that. So the mom would say to the person, oh, you don't have to wonder. It's going to be oatmeal every single day until you die. So now you don't have to worry about it. Right, see, and this butt whooping <laughs> every day until you die. So, uh, so God, the manna was not a blessing. It was not a ooh. It was like this is your discipline. This is your punishment. Just like the rod, okay. Just like the testimony. Just like the the Ten Commandments. It says, and Moses said to Aaron, take a pot and put an omer of manna in it, manna, not manner, manna in it, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. Put it in the ark to be kept for generations. I want it to be kept for generations. Just like uh, the testimony, just like the rod, so that you can remind yourself of your rebellions. And that's why it's called the mercy seat. You were rebellious, and yet I had mercy on you. Uh, now in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 3, it says, And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, <laughs> and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which, inside that little, I call it a little golden, little mini coffin thing, because you could open it up. It's like a little window seat kind of thing that you could open up. Were the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. That's what, what the, those three were inside. Now, here's just something interesting. So God had him put all three inside, and this is around 1200 B.C. In one, 200 years later, in 1,000 years B.C., that's when David became king. And his son Solomon followed shortly after, 900 and something B.C. Uh, so it's about 300 years later, 250, 300 years later. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel, to King Solomon in Jerusalem. Everybody come, all the heads of the tribes, there's 12 tribes, come on down, that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the city of David, which is Zion. So we're going to take it from Jerusalem and put it into the temple. Verse 9 says, Nothing was in the Ark except the two tablets of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb. So they had taken out the manna and the rod over the years. Uh, and probably just looked at the man and said, well, this is old oatmeal. It's been here for 200 years. You need to get rid of that. Oh, and, and why is this old branch in here? Took it out. They left the, they left the commandments in there. And when the Lord, uh, so nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb. And when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. That, so, and it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place at the cloud filled the house of the Lord, and God blessed them. But they, they forgot the lessons, right? They said, I don't I need to hear that anymore. Why are we going over this old stuff? This happened a long time ago. And the last time that they were blessed was David and Solomon. All the succeeding kings, except for Josiah, led the people astray because they just forgot the old lessons. That's, you know, why do you teach so much in the Old Testament? Because these lessons are put here for us to learn. We're going to repeat them if, if we're not careful. So they emptied the... Anyway, so God said, I want you to leave them there for generations. So put that rod in there and, so that you can learn. Okay, God, whatever you say. Yeah, let's just clean this. Is, I'll do spring cleaning. That old branch in here and some old oatmeal. Numbers chapter 17, verse 11. Thus did Moses, just as the Lord had commanded him, so he did. So the children of Israel spoke to Moses, saying, Surely we die, we perish, we're all going to perish. Why? Why are they saying that? Why are they freaking out? 
Okay, just reminding us. Okay, so he, so the 250 people were killed. But here's how it had been presented to them. Uh, in, in Numbers chapter 16, verse 23. So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the congregation saying, get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Get away from them. Now they're all on their side. God, Moses has to tell them, you better get away from there. So they get away, but not because they disagreed with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. They just, okay, Moses is saying, move away. Okay, he's always giving us orders. But they still stole, they thought they were right. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan, and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. Okay, we'll back up. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and Dathan, Abiram came out and they stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. Like, what you about to do? Let's see what's about to happen. Verse 32, and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed them, those mm -hmm. specific three people, and their wives, not their sons, because their sons went with the other congregation and says, daddy's a little crazy. But his little group here, and the earth opened his mouth, swallowed them up with their households, all the men with Korah, with all their goods. Verse 41. And here's, what the con here's how they reacted to it. On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. They're the people of the Lord. You've killed them. We still think they're the people of the Lord. You're wrong. You are wrong. They were on God's side, and you killed them. So that's why God is doing this whole exercise. Let me show you whose side I'm actually on. And then the rod of, Mo of Aaron buds. And now people go, uh oh, we're in trouble. Because we thought you were wrong. Up until this moment, we cursed you. We yelled at you. We still didn't, even after those people were killed, we still thought you were wrong. And now, we see this miracle that God has chosen you. So they said, uh oh, we're all going to perish. And here's the last verse in this 17. Whoever comes near the tabernacle of the Lord must die. Shall we all utterly die? Like, oh no, we're, this, we messed up. God's about to kill us all because we challenged you. So uh, next week, I'll, we'll go through uh, Numbers 18 and see how God what that does in answer to this, right? But it's finally occurred to people after all this. And again, we're the same way. God shows us stuff and we interpret it wrong. Well, that happened because, because we already have a scenario in our head. We already know who, what side we're backing and what's going on. And so uh, whatever happens, you know, the person that we're already backing, the person that we're behind, they get in a car accident, and we could say to ourselves, hmm, that person was almost killed. Maybe, maybe that's a sign, like, you know, God's protection is, is leaving that person. Or we could say, wow, that person was always killed, and God protected them, and they weren't killed. And that must mean a good thing, like God's on that person's side. <coughs> Excuse me. It depends on the pre-scenario we have in our head called confirmation bias, right? We've already decided who's right and who's wrong in, in whatever situation. So we interpret events that happen according to what we already were thinking. So when the ground opened up and swallowed those 250 men, they said, Moses just killed those people, the Lord. What's wrong with him? They didn't go, wow, that was God's judgment. And so, because they had already decided whose side they were on, Moses had to scream at them, get away from those people, get, and they're, uh, like grudgingly they went away. So don't touch their stuff, because Korah and them had like, had their own tents uh, where they were probably leading their own worship or something, you know? Because uh, Moses had, a, had, had them build a tent, but he says, get away from the tents of those people. Don't touch their stuff. So my, people were flocking there for whatever reason. They were already on their side. And when Moses said, get away from them, that didn't mean anything to these people. They didn't say, oh, they must be bad. They just went, oh, Moses must be crazy. And when the ground opened, swallowed them, said, you killed, they're the people, Lord, and what's wrong with you? So we have to be careful. If we could just go to neutral, then when God is doing something, we can hopefully 
interpret it the right way and say, oh, that's why that happened. So uh, I was, I'm making this up. I'm making this up. I was driving drunk last night and uh, I was almost killed, but God spared me. So that must be God showing me that he's on my side and that he, that even if I'm drunk, he will protect me. Like that, I can come up with, with that interpretation, you know, because I, my life was saved. And so therefore God is showing me how, that it's okay what I'm doing because I could have gotten killed and look, he spared me. So therefore God must be on my side. Or I can say, wow, I better stop doing that. I almost died last night. So that must be God's sign to me saying, look how close you came to death because you're drinking and driving. So I better stop what I'm doing because I was almost killed. God didn't spare me as a means of showing me how much he's on my side. God spared me to, to show me you barely made it, but next time you may not make it. So it depends on my own interpretation, right? And if we are in neutral, sometimes we can get the right interpretation of events because God's always speaking to us, always, always, always speaking to us. And depending on how we read the Bible, we, we add our own interpretation in. So uh, God is doubling down. I forget what I call this uh, lesson, but God is trying to make his double point <laughs> that, um, um, that no, I'm really choosing Aaron. That didn't happen because Moses messed up. That happened because you guys were messing up. And, and, and so I'm doubling down on the point to make sure you really get what I'm, what I'm saying. Yes. Yes. So anyway, I'm going to, I'm ending there. Thank you so much. I don't mean to keep teasing Revelation. I see Jan, Janet Horton. Uh, yeah, the teaching Revelation it will be really good. It's coming up. It's going to be a Wednesday. Some of you don't watch on Wednesdays. Uh, but on Wednesdays, I'm teaching on the book of Luke, then the book of Acts, then Revelation. But I have to teach all this groundwork so that when we get there, that you'll go, oh, I know what that means. Oh, I know what that symbol means. Oh, I know why that's there. Because everything in the book of Revelation is referring to some Old Testament scriptures, referring to some old, God's not making up a whole bunch of new stuff. He, it's, it's the culmination of what he has been teaching them in all these scriptures. It's like, so that's why I was looking with the rod of Jesse. Uh, he, it started, you know, with Aaron's rod that blossomed almonds. And then he says, oh, I see an almond tree blossom. Yes. So just like I blessed Aaron, you can say that I'm blessing here. This is not an arbitrary uh, metaphor. He's used it before and now he's using it again. God does that all the time. So when we get to the book of Revelation, you'll, you'll see, oh, these are things that God was always talking about. This is not some new thing. He's using pictures and images that he's always spoken to them through. And so they understood when they read the book of Revelation, they went, oh, that makes sense. Anyway, so, uh, but that's a ways away. So thank you so much uh, for listening in. And uh, I will uh, see some of you on Wednesdays. And I apologize because I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot <laughs> Sunday and Wednesday. Some of you don't mind, but some of you can just take so much. Uh, but some of you I will see on Wednesdays where we're in the New Testament. And others of you I'll see again next week. I really appreciate you listening in. All right. Bye-bye.